One thing I thought was exciting this morning was all the young people, most of them were up front. I think that's great. That's great. You know, I was talking to my daughter Rachel the other day about reading. And the reason I was talking to her about reading is because in one of her classes, she has to read a ton of books. And so I encouraged her to read some smaller books so she'd be able to uh, meet the requirements without a lot of stress. And her response kind of surprised me a little bit. She said, Dad, I don't like reading small books. The stories come to an end too quickly. And I was thinking about that as I was writing this sermon as well. And I was thinking, you know, I kind of feel the same way about this series we're in, the gospel story. I mean, it's, it, it's just coming too quickly for us. Three weeks ago, we talked about creation. We talked about how when God made us in the beginning that we were good. We were created in the image of God. Then two weeks ago, we talked about the fall. We talked about this epic shift that took place in the Garden of Eden, where we went from good to bad, where we went from perfect to imperfect. And then last week, we talked about how God redeemed us through His Son, Jesus Christ, how He brought us back and bought us out of the bondage of sin. Now this week, we're going to talk about something else. I think this is the question that most of us should ask if we haven't done it already. Okay, I'm saved now. I'm saved now, what's next? I mean, we're in Christ, we don't have to worry about going to hell anymore, we know we're going to heaven, and so the question is, what's next? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to talk about the restoration of man. Now when it comes to restoration, I hope you can see this as I preach, but restoration is really a two-part process. When we get saved, we are restored uh, internally, we are born again. <clears throat> But then there's the, the rest of our life, the outside. And that's a daily process, a daily process that we need to make sure that we keep on top of. And so as I preach this message this morning, I hope you will always remember those two things, that sanctification, that restoration is a two-part process. In one sense, we're completely restored internally. Our spirits are right with God. But externally, it is a, we are a work in progress. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand this morning. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians. We're going to be looking at chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Are we ready? All right, ready or not, here we go. Verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, let us pray. Father God, we are here just uh, so grateful, Father God. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful, Father God, that the salvation process is complete. That when we put our faith in you and in your son, Jesus that at that moment we were completely and totally saved. This morning, help us to understand what that next step is, Lord, what you want us to do, and that is to extinguish sin from our lives, Lord, to grow in holiness, to grow in sanctification, Lord. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be present today, and Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to see the areas of our lives, Lord, that still need to be restored. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, if you were to go over to my house and you walked into the downstairs bathroom, you would see a beautiful black cabinet there. 
Kelly bought this a couple of months ago or so, and she paid eleven dollars and fifty cents for it, and, and it was in pretty bad shape. And so she had to strip the paint off of it. She had to sand it. She had to put new primer on it and new paint. But today, she's taken that something that was old and worn, and she's made it look brand new. And I know some of you are probably thinking, why can't she do that with her husband? He's kind of old and worn. Why can't she make him brand new? And here's my response. I'm an antique. You don't mess with antiques. You know, in a sense, that's what God has done for us. Don't laugh too hard, you might hurt my feelings. <laughs> in verse 8, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And I really believe that that verse is talking about the change that God makes on the inside of us. On the inside, spiritually speaking, we are new creatures in Christ when we put our faith in Christ. The Bible also calls that being born again. In fact, Jesus makes it absolutely clear that to get to heaven, to spend eternity with Jesus, we have to be what? We have to be born again. In fact, over in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus is talking to a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? In order to go to heaven, in order to see God, in order to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, we have to be what? We have to be born again. Paul also talks about this new birth. He talks about the restoring of our soul, about getting things right with God when he says this in 1 Corinthians 6.11. He says, such were some of you. And in verse 10, he had talked about all kinds of terrible sins, reminding the Corinthians that at one time they were caught up in, in these kinds of sins. He says, such were some of you, but you've been washed. But you've been sanctified, but you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Spirit of our God. And so let me tell you something this morning. If you are in Christ, you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified. I mean, someone ought to be jumping up and down right now. We're talking about some good news. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about sin being totally atoned for. And someone ought to be excited about that this morning. Amen. You know, last Sunday we saw that happen with our own eyes. Last Sunday we watched as Rebecca Branson came forward and gave her life and her heart to Jesus Christ. And you know, the beautiful thing is as we were watching her being baptized, God gave us a, a, an outward picture of what was taking place on the inside of her. That on the inside of her she was dying to that old life. And as she came out of that water, she was being raised. She was being restored to walk in newness of life. I mean, that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, that's why we're here. This is why we do what we do. We're not a clubhouse. We're not a country club. We are a hospital. We are a life-saving station. Back six times this year, we have fulfilled God's mandate to go and make disciples. I want to take a second to uh, kind of pat Sheena on the back. There she is over there. Sheena had been talking to Becca about coming to church. She talked to Becca about Jesus. And, uh, and then she invited Becca to come to church. And she came. And look at what happened. And so great job, Sheena. Great job. I mean, that's what, amen? Amen. I mean, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, go and make disciples. We're not waiting for people to come to church. We have to go out and get them. Amen. Now, this isn't about a guilt trip at all. I hope you understand that. But ask yourself this question. This is first person. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time I invited someone to church? I mean, according to statistics, 82% people say if a friend invited them to church, that they would come. And so maybe the only reason some of your friends and neighbors aren't coming to church is because nobody's ever invited them. And so don't look at this as a guilt trip. Look at this as, a, as an opportunity. 82% of the people said that. So go out this week and invite someone to your church. Amen? Amen? 
Now, is it possible that we sell the church short? Is it possible that we let other people define the church like the media? You know, I love the church. And I realize it's not perfect, but there is no place like it in all the world. It's kind of like our country. You know, it may not be perfect either, but there is no country like it in all the world. Amen? Amen. Now, in the past, I know that people have been hurt by what I'll just label church people. These people were judging and condemning them. And the sad part is I still sometimes see that attitude in the church today, although it is dying out. But we still see that. And I like to think of these people as self-righteous bigots, condemning the world for their sin, while they themselves are harboring the greatest sin of all, which is pride. Now these people, I don't believe they're the church, even though they go to church. These people don't know the grace of God. And so let me suggest that they don't know the God of grace. I mean, think about that this morning. If you don't know the grace of God, how can you possibly know the God of grace? Amen? I mean, these people, they go to church, but that doesn't guarantee that they are Christians any more than being in a garage guarantees your car. You know, it's all about what happens inside of here. Amen? You know, every person outside the church is in the need of restoration. In fact, everybody inside the church is, need, is in the need of restoration. We all have that same problem. Some of us may be farther along than others, but we're all in the need of restoration. And let me just say this. Just as we wouldn't turn people away from a hospital because they're sick, we should never, ever turn people away from the church just because they have sin in their lives. I mean, what does Jesus want? He wants them to be saved. He wants them to be healed. He wants them to be restored. Amen? Amen. Now, Jesus often criticized the Pharisees because they appeared to be clean on the outside, but on the inside they were utterly, utterly filthy. Jesus makes it clear that true transformation always begins on the inside, and it makes its way to the outside, amen? And it's not the other way around. In fact, in Matthew 23, verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. I want you to know I added verse 27 to that passage I just read to make sure that everybody understands that when Jesus talks about um, cleaning the inside of the bowl, the, cleaning the inside of the cup, he really wasn't talking about a bowl or a cup. He was talking about the heart. He was talking about cleaning our hearts, being born again. But did you know that even Jesus' own disciples were not immune to looking clean on the outside, but not being clean on the inside? In fact, over in John 13, 11, Jesus is talking about one such disciple by the name of Judas Iscariot, when he says, For he knew that one who was betraying him, for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. And here's the irony. If you looked at Judas from the outside, I mean, he looked like all the other disciples. But when you looked on the inside, you could see something that was completely different. In fact, John tells us that Judas was also a thief. But on the outside, he looked like everyone else. The problem with Judas is he did not have a transformation on the inside. The point I'm trying to make is that true restoration begins on the inside. It begins in the heart. You know, when we are saved, it is an inward cleansing, like I've been saying, that will eventually make its way to the outside. The truth is, outwardly, we're all a work in progress. Outwardly, we are all in the process of restoration. But inwardly, inwardly, we are completely clean. Because God has made us completely clean because of the blood of Jesus. I love what Paul says in Romans 8.1. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those 
who are in Christ Jesus. And so why is that? It's because of the blood of Jesus. I like what he says over here in verse 21 of our text. He says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And really what Paul's describing there in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is that there was an exchange that took place. We exchanged our sin. We gave our sin to Jesus. And you know what he gave us? He gave us his righteousness. I think that's a pretty good exchange, don't you? We gave Jesus our sin, and hallelujah, he gave us his righteousness. And I think that's just pretty awesome. Now, one thing I want to point out is I, I mentioned in Romans 8.1, where Paul makes it clear that there is no condemnation. But do you realize just the chapter before in chapter 7, Paul was talking about his battle with sin? And I think it's, it's purposeful that 7 precedes 8. Because if 8 preceded 7, and let's say the, the chapters were different, then you might get the idea, well, you're saved as long as you battle sin. As long as you win the battle with sin. But I think Paul purposely put chapter 7, put this battle of sin before chapter 8. To let us know that even though we battle with sin, even though sin is a problem, we are secure in our salvation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But like I said, Paul battled sin, just like you and I do. There really is no difference. And listen to how he describes his battle and see if this doesn't sound familiar to you. It should. In Romans 7, verses 18 and 19, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. I mean, does that sound familiar? Has that ever happened to you? You, you, you see somebody in need, you know that as a Christian you're supposed to help them, but then you don't do what you know that you should be doing. That's our sin nature. That's our flesh. Our spirit has been restored, but our flesh is still tainted by the fall. Now let me just say this. That doesn't mean we can't have victory. All that means is it's not going to be a walk in the park. All that means is as long as we breathe air on this earth, as long as, our, as, long as we are trapped in this body of flesh, is we will never completely get rid of sin. And that will happen until the day that we finally get to heaven and we get our new spiritual bodies. But it's going to be a battle. Now, and, the, and the key is this, is make sure that you don't let sin control you, but that you control sin. That you don't let your sin nature master you, but that you master your sin nature. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, but I discipline my body, and I make it my slave. I think what Paul's saying there is every time he saw sin getting the upper hand in his life, he would go to war with that sin. He would start disciplining his body. He would start taking on that sin and dealing with it. It's kind of like with a car. You have a car, and a little spot of rust shows up. What do you need to do? You need to get a wire brush out there, or you need to get a grinder, and you need to get on it. Because if you don't, guess what? It's just going to get worse. It's going to look like that right there. If you don't take care of it, it will just spread and spread. And so let me ask this question for you this morning. Where is the rust in your life? Where are the areas in your life where sin has found a safe place to live? You know, sin is a lot like rust. Starts off with just small thing here, small thing here, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Before long, it's it's out of control. You know, when I was in the Navy, <clears throat> Buddy can attest to this as well. Having been in the Navy, um, rust is a problem with Navy ships. When you're out there on the ocean with that <clears throat> corrosive salt, it's a problem. So you have to have regular maintenance to take care of it. And the same is true for sin. We have to be actively restoring our lives, and we have to be actively battling sin in our lives. That's one of the reasons that you need a good, loving church to be a part of. 
A church that will continue to remind you to go the right way. A church that will continually remind you to try to live up to the goal that God has for you. The standard that he wants you to live under. And so you need a good church. You know, one of the things that amazes me is what happens to people when they quit going to church. Now, I'm not being legalistic about church here. I'm just making some observations of things that I've seen. I mean, I've seen people leave church and they start believing things that the Bible says are absolutely not true. Like I know someone that has left the church and now they are reading books about reincarnation. Something that the Bible clearly says is not true. In fact, reincarnation comes from the Hindu religion. It doesn't come from the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that it's not true, like I said, in Hebrews 9.27. It says, inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once. To die how many times? Once. once. And after this comes judgment. And so not many lives, but one life. See, the lie the devil wants us to, to believe is that we can blow it in this life and we're going to have multiple chances to get it right in the future. But the Bible is clear that we only have one life, that when we die, there are no second chances. There are many second chances in this life, but once we die, that's the end. And so just remember this, this idea of reincarnation is just a lie from the devil to believe that this life really doesn't matter. But you and I both know that it does. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I also know a lady, I've told this story before, but I, I have to tell it again, that came to this church for a short period of time. And uh, she didn't like one of the sermons I preached. She told me, oh, we're perfect just the way we are. She would disagree with this message this morning. Because she wouldn't see any need to change. And, and needless to say, this lady wasn't a very nice lady. I saw her at the walk-in clinic a while back, and I just was asking her how it was going. And she told me, and I'm not kidding, she told me this. She said, you know, I went to every church in Sweet Home, and I couldn't find one church that was preaching what I wanted to hear. Isn't that crazy? You gotta go find a church that's gonna preach what you want to hear. What if what you want to hear isn't what you need to hear? I mean, she had some heavy duty sin in her life, and what she wanted was some make, some mascara to put on that sin to make it look a little better. But what she really needed was life changed, and that's one thing that the church can help you with. So don't ever underestimate the value of being a part of a good church. And I want to tell you something this morning. This is a good church. This is a good church. Amen? Amen. Now earlier I mentioned that Kelly had restored this cabinet. But what you need to understand is that it took her several weeks, a couple months actually, to get the project done. And so it took commitment and it took hard work. But the result is she's got this beautiful cabinet. Now I also have this cabinet up in my room and I've had this cabinet for about 48 years. I guess it's an antique like me. You know, years and years ago, I started to restore it. I started stripping some of the paint off of it. and I just, I don't know, I just gave up. Today, it's so dilapidated looking that it embarrasses Kelly to the point that she actually put something over it to cover it. So people can't see how bad it looks. And so as we conclude this message today, let me ask you this question. Which cabinet most resembles your life? Kelly's or mine? Is your life a work in progress? Are you actually trying to restore and purge the sin out of your life? Or does your life more resemble my cabinet that's up, kind of covered, trying to cover up the sin in our lives? That you kind of maybe you started at first, but then you kind of gave up. Now, let me just say this we're not talking about salvation. If you are in Christ, you are saved. What we're talking about is sanctification. What we're talking about is holiness. What we're talking about is growing into the men and women and, and children, boys and girls that God has called us to be. What we're talking about is restoring our lives to the point that when people look at us, they can see Jesus shining through in our lives by the way we love and by the way we do. Amen.